Anche is a uh, consultant pathologist, uh, especially in microbiology, that would be a yes, fair description, yes, Anche, yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Dunedin Hospital and also um, in, in private in Dunedin. So very knowledgeable about uh, things to do with uh, microbiology and medicine in general. So welcome and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now, looking around at you people, I see that most of you are retired clinicians or laboratory workers. So, oh now, how many of you have either got an infection at work or seen somebody else, one of their colleagues, get an infection at work? Come on. <laughs> okay, well, we can sort of swap anecdotes at the end of the session. <laughs> but it's definitely uh, one of our occupational hazards. And I will talk about some historical events as well as some recent events. Okay, now, I've been working on this talk for at least a couple of months, as some of my colleagues can, can fail for, and you start looking up lots and lots of books and references, but the problem is, you're copying from one book, it's called plagiarism, but if you use two or more books, it's called research. <laughs> <laughs> but the biggest problem with that, many books that you look up have copied from each other. So as, if one book starts up a myth, a myth of some kind, very soon it gets copied onto another book or another paper, as the case may be. So as time went on and I started looking at some of the individuals I'm gonna talk about, I ended up quite confused because I didn't know which is the right story. So anyway, uh, the reason for that is that you're welcome to correct me if you think I'm saying anything absolutely stupid or we can leave it to all again, that's fine. I've just done the best I can. And one of the biggest culprits was this book that I read as a teenager. It's a wonderful book. It's written about 100 years ago called The Microbe Hunters by Paul de Crove. And he wrote medical history as an adventure story, and he never let facts get in the way of a good story, basically. So he made up all sorts of things that weren't strictly true. And the problem is, well, some of the other papers that I've read have copied, you know, written down what he'd said. So there we go. So we'll start with the first patient. So he was a previously healthy uh, infectious disease physician working for WHO in Hanoi, and he flew over to Bangkok. And on the way over, he started getting really unwell with fever, headache, feeling absolutely lethargic. And he'd been looking after quite a few patients and staff members in Hanoi, people who'd uh, got, had the same disease, and many of them had actually died with it. So he realized that he was probably coming down with the same infection. So he called one of his colleagues up when he arrived to Bangkok, and they arranged for an ambulance to get kitted up in isolation gear, and they took him to an isolation hospital in Bangkok. He sat in hospital, he got better after the first few days and then started developing a terrible cough. And as you can see here, he progressively developed ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and he died of a cardiac arrest. And the rumors had been going around for the previous month that something really strange was going on in China, that hospitals were closing and that people were dying and it was some sort of pneumonia. They didn't know what was going on. They thought it might be avian influenza because it wasn't long after H5N1 came to the fore. So that was the hospital that this person was working at. And here he is here. His name was Carlo Urbani. And as you've probably realized by now, the disease he was dealing with was SARS. And he did try to take precautions. He wore masks, but he didn't have all the right protective gear. And he had so much personal contact with different patients that he just got infected. And the other thing he did, you know, everybody was still thinking it was avian flu, but he didn't think so. He, he alerted WHO that something odd was going on, and he put the, some specimens of patients in his pocket and got on a scooter and drove across Hanoi to another laboratory where they could do some testing, and the laboratory staff heard that the specimens were coming, so most of them took out the door and were never seen again. But a couple, a couple stayed behind and voluntarily isolated themselves, and they discovered this a uh, virus called SARS. It's a coronavirus, it's a RNA virus. 
So that's nucleic acid is RNA. And when it replicates itself, there is no proofreading. So there's a lot of mutation as the virus replicates. And we see that also with influenza and uh, HIV, the whole RNA viruses, they mutate rapidly. And they eventually, and I think I've got a pointer here. Oh, yeah. They eventually found that they didn't know where it came from. They initially found it in palm civets, but that was, they didn't think that was the primary host. They did eventually find that the primary host, it came from bats. And, the, and but from bats it went to civets. And from civets, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, that it sort of mutated into a form that could infect human beings. And why did it happen? It's because in Southeast Asia, you have a thing called wet markets where you have a lot of live animals. They don't, didn't have refrigerators, so you just went and got your meat at the market and they either curled it for you or you did it yourself when you got home. So you had large numbers of animals crowded together, soiling over each other. And when you have infectious agents with ability to mutate rapidly, you've got the recipe for new emerging infections. And this is one of the ways probably that some of the avian flu strains arose too. So before, so here at the top you see the bat, and the bottom there you see this palm civet. And they use it for all sorts of things like aphrodisiac and coffee, and I don't know how they do that. <laughs> and uh, so there were about 20% roughly were healthcare workers of people that got SARS, and the death rate was 10%. So let's talk about human infection for a minute. The way that we get infected is either from other human beings or from the environment or from animals that we're in contact with or via an insect vector like a mosquito or a tick or flea or something. So different pathogens have ability to be transmitted by different insect vectors. And the way that we get infected is either airborne or by each swallowing it, or drinking it, or by just direct transmission through skin or mucous membranes, and that could be by a cut or something like that. So we'll run over some more cases now. So here we had 1978, this really old laboratory or medical school in Birmingham at the time, and this person, Janet Parker, got flu-like symptoms. <coughs> a few days later, developed spots, brought into hospital, she got a lot worse and she died within a month. And she had worked in, oh, sorry, one, worked in the anatomy department in a photography room right above the microbiology department. And you all, most of you will know what we're talking about here, which disease. Yeah, hopefully. Anybody not know? <laughs> no? <laughs> no? You know, but I told you. Oh, you don't? <laughs> Okay, well, she got this real severe pustular rash which just went confluent all over her face and she died. And it was actually smallpox. Oh. Yeah. And I'll tell you the story about that. She, so this is the head of the microbiology laboratory, uh, Henry Bitson, and he'd been doing smallpox research for years and years in this really sort of ancient laboratory. And the WHO had come around a couple of years before and said, your laboratory conditions aren't good enough, you've got to stop working. But they just adv adv advised a few changes, which he did, and he carried on working. And then in the middle of 78, they came around and said, OK, you've got to close down by the end of the year. We've nearly wiped out smallpox. We don't want you guys working with smallpox anymore. So he actually pretended that he was winding down, but he didn't because he thought he was on the verge of some major breakthrough. So he actually upped his research. And that's the layout of the laboratory here. So that's where the smallpox work was being done with a biohazard cabinet. That's another animal laboratory. And that's the central laboratory. And it goes straight out into the corridor outside. And there's no negative airflow or anything. And the people were supposed to be working in the biohazard cabinet in the smallpox laboratory, but they weren't. They were just wandering all over the place in the same gowns and gloves and going from one part of the lab to the other. Um, so, so there were major problems. Yet negative, it wasn't a negative pressure laboratory. There was no anti room, nowhere where people could get sort of dressed up. You know, you know what the PC4 laboratories look like now, where they actually really spacesuit things. 
they weren't using biohazard cabinet staff were walking in and out when the same guns of gloves as I mentioned. It was plenty of opportunity for the fires to get airborne because they were pipetting out in an open laboratory. So you get big aerosols when you pipette things. And then the way that she got infected, the air was actually being sucked up into that ventilation shaft I've, I've circled there and it was going up into the laboratory where she was working and that's how she got smallpox. But so she died, but before she died, her father had a heart attack and died, and Henry Bedson committed suicide. So there were three deaths as a result of that episode. And that's just to remind you what smallpox used to look like. And it can be, you know, there are different varieties, some are relatively mild, but if you had the variola major, if you got the hemorrhagic form at the bottom there, you had virtually 100% mortality. So it was a horrible disease that obviously we've managed to eradicate now. What's, where it came from, we're not sure. It's not that old. It's only been around for about six or 10,000 years at the most. And so the virus that's strictly adapted to human beings, and once you get, get smallpox, and if you recover, you're forever immune. So you've got to have a, a quite a big population to actually maintain it. It's a bit like measles as well. So it's a combination of an animal, a, a virus that's come out of some animals, possibly camels or something similar, when in the beginning of the agricultural age. And at, at the same time, there was a big enough susceptible population to maintain it. So it's uh, still a mystery as to how it actually came about. And this is Terry's favourite, this is the Antonine Plague. Um, it was described by Galen, you've all heard of Galen, he was a physician and a historian, I think, and he actually gave a very accurate description of what the virus, the, the clinical, what the, what the disease was, the clinical description. I don't think, as far as we know, we've actually definitely proven it's uh, smallpox, it could have also been measles, but anyway, it absolutely decimated the Roman troops and, and then allowed invasion from the north by the Germanic tribes. And I've seen some stories saying that Galen actually died of whatever it was too, and I, again, I can't verify that, but that's some of the stories I've read. And Dr. Henry Gray, he, and he's, he wrote a book called Grey's Anatomy, and that's a book and not the television program Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was anatomist and surgeon, and he thought he was immune to smallpox because he nursed quite a few patients with smallpox. Uh, but he actually died of smallpox after looking after his nephew who had smallpox. The nephew recovered. Henry Gray died. But we don't have any details of his final illness because the custom at the time was as anybody died, they would just come along and collect all the positions and burn them. So any documentation was just lost around there. And it's another outbreak a bit earlier on. And this index case was an engineer who'd come from Pakistan and he'd forged his vaccination certificate. They don't actually thought he'd ever been vaccinated. Anyway, he was admitted sick to hospital. They put him in an isolation ward because they thought he had typhoid, but he was next, never actually isolated. So he sat around for at least five days before he started developing spots and they diagnosed smallpox and at the time they diagnosed his smallpox he was actually coughing all over the place and he had lots of spots in, in his mouth and on his skin so it's quite likely that he was coughing the virus out into the environment and within the next month there were 19 further cases including four deaths including one nurse who died so so we always used to think smallpox is something that you get you know, person to person, but this is actually very good evidence that this was airborne because a lot of people, most of the other patients, he was always in, a, always in a single room. So most of the other, none of the other patients who got smallpox had direct contact with him. They were very good at things like linen and that sort of thing and utensils. So there was no chance of them going from room to room. And when they were trying to investigate it, they let off smoke bombs in this patient's room and they could detect smoke going down the corridors into the adjacent patient's room room and up the central stairwell. So that's the location here where the, small, the other secondary and tertiary smallpox cases were. 
and I had to finish off with this one, uh, Operation Smallpox Zero. It sort of reminds me a bit of Operation Liberation Iraq or something like that, but that's what they called it. Operation Smallpox Zero, and that's the WHO campaign to eliminate smallpox. And one of the last strongholds of smallpox in the world was Ethiopia. So the WHO just poured all their resources into Ethiopia and they were just sort of ring fencing any new case that would vaccinate all the contacts and so on. And the problem was with Ethiopia, the roads were pretty poor and there was also just been a revolution and the Emperor Haile Selassie had been assassinated. And there were a couple of rebel groups and one of them was sympathetic to the smallpox campaign and the other ones weren't. So the second group actually would capture some of these smallpox teams from time to time and several of the workers were killed. But then they got some helicopters and that was much better because they could get over the roads. And then one of the helicopter teams got, with the smallpox vaccination teams got captured. So the WHO was busy negotiating their release. And while all this was going on, the helicopter pilot had become a really keen smallpox vaccinator. So before they got liberated, he'd actually managed to vaccinate all the rebels in their group. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'll just carry on. Now and then the plague, which is caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. And on the top right there, you see an electron micrograph of the bacteria, which I have trouble figuring out. It's probably somewhere in the collection there. And on the bottom right there, you can see the flea that's associated. Now, it's, we've proven definitely that the Black Death was caused by Yersinia pestis. It may have been a slightly different strain that we see today, but it's definitely Yersinia pestis. They've dug up old bones and teeth and they've proven that it was Yersinia pestis. So at the time, there was a very high death rate and people would just disappear. So it was left to people like monks and nuns and, and a few physicians that were around to look after the sick people and a lot of the monks died, undermined the authority of the church. And the bug itself is fascinating too because again it's not that old an organism, it's only a, oh, it's somewhere between, a th th oh, I think thousands too short, but I think some, 1000 BC that should be, 1000 BC to 50,000 BC it's when it arose. It arose from a bug called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which we still have today. There was an outbreak in New Zealand a couple of years ago related to some lettuce you buy at the supermarket. So it's a quite a common, it's not that common bug we see today. It's not in face. If you don't get septicemia, you don't get plague or anything like that. So Yersinia pestis has become pathogenic. And it's picked up a couple of plasmids, you know, that's the mobile genetic sort of circular loops that you can get, they're called plasmids. And that one there, oh, wrong button. That one there is, uh, has a lot of ferulence elements, fer ferulence factors, and that one too. So these are the genes coding, coding for the ferulence factors. And the one on the left there is producing has genes that allow the bacterium to survive in the gut of fleas and that's what actually was needed. So that it needed to have the ability to survive inside the humans and invade and multiply. And in order to be transmitted efficiently, you had to, so you had to get from one host to the other. Uh, whereas you see near pseudotuberculosis, you just get from fecal contamination, but this one is now a different kettle because you've now got another host in between, which happens to be the flea. So there are several types of uh, plague, we also call it plague uh, cycles. <coughs> the bottom, top left one there, you've got the one that still occurs in nature in parts of Asia and Americas, where you have a cycle of rodents and fleas and possibly other mammals. So what happens is the flea bites on an infected animal and its gut gets engorged with blood and bacteria in it well and because the gut's completely engorged it gets really hungry because it can't absorb any food so it goes like mad turning around different hosts trying to get some food in and every time it feeds it regurgitates blood and bacteria into the next host now that's how the, that's the natural cycle of the plague humans we get infected either by bitten by an infected flea or by getting coming into contact with an infected animal 
And as I've said, it's now acquired ferulins genes that allow it to multiply in the host. So in the early stage, depending on how you, how you get infected, you might just get really swollen lymph nodes because the bacteria multiply in the lymph nodes. But sooner or later, you're going to get spillover in the bloodstream. And if it gets to the lungs, you then form infectious sputum so that you can infect another person. And if you come in contact with somebody who's coughing up infected sputum, you get direct person-to-person -person transmission. Now, some more interesting stories. Herman Mueller, he was a member of the Plague Commission that went to India, and when they came home, he wanted to carry on his research, so he took plague organisms home, but they couldn't grow it very well and on a plate in a, a petri dish in a lab, and it wouldn't prove anything, so he needed live animals. So they kept rats in the laboratories, and it was really crowded conditions, and the researchers kept rats in their own lab as they were working away, and one of the rat handlers got bitten. No, no, he got infected. Uh, from a rat with skin lesions and he was admitted to a hospital where he was being looked after by Mueller. And Mueller didn't actually think it was plague so he didn't isolate him. And before the rat hand had died, uh, Mueller plus a nurse got infected and they all died of pneumonic plague. So this animal worker was got, got skin lesions which went septicemic, went to the lung, um, and then he was directly infectious to Mueller and to the nurse. So the reason that happened is because the animal, because Mueller didn't realise it was plague, they just thought it was flu, so nobody wore masks such as they were. And they only realised it was plague when they found gram-negative bacteria in the sputum. And now the interesting thing is that plague's not normally infectious. Uh, even in pneumonic plague until the very end stage of the illness. So here we have a lung of someone who's died of pneumonic plague and on the left there you can see lots of areas of consolidation and over here you can see areas of hemorrhage as well. And that's the histology, the cross section of the lung. And ba basically what you can see here, these are the what's left of the alveolar walls. And the alveolar are full of polymorphs and blood and in there will be lots and lots of bacteria as well. And that's what a sputum would look like. Sorry to do this before dinner, but uh, there we are. <laughs> so at the very end stage, when the lung starts becoming necrotic is when you're infectious. So just if, I were, if one of you had plague, you know, as long as you've been coughing a low for me and had bloody sputum, you wouldn't infect me. It's very simple to, you know, and as long as you didn't have fleas that jumped onto me, then you wouldn't get, <laughs> I wouldn't get infected. Um, so very simple masks well, is enough to actually stop transmission, plus standard precautions, hand washing, that sort of thing. And so there may be something to be said even for those masks that they wore in the Middle, middle Ages with those beaks. I think, of, you know, that it was thought that, because they thought that plague and other illnesses were some sort of evil spirits, miasmas in the air, and, that was, and, that, and the mask had herbs to kill off the miasmas, whatever. But I think it was just putting physical distance between any airborne bacteria. Now, he was a, a wildlife biologist working in Grand Canyon Park, National Park, and he found a dead mountain lion. So he thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what he died of. So I picked up the mountain lion, slung him over his shoulder, took him home and did a post-mortem on the mountain lion. And then a few days later, he got a flu-like illness, went to the clinic, they diagnosed influenza, sent him home again. He came back the following day, but sick, I sent him home again. You still got the flu. And then they found him dead at home and he'd died of, well, uh, new, actually he had pneumonic plague, but because he, was, he died at home by himself, he didn't infect anybody else. The way that he got infected was probably through doing the post-mortem in this garage without any protective gear, there, there is his hands, no gloves on, and just using ordinary pass tools that you get in a garage. And this is just to show you what the Black Plague would have looked like with the peripheral gangrene. And this is a common way, you know, you see that with all sorts of organisms, and we see that with meningococcal septicemia if you survive sometimes, you see the peripheral gangrene like that. So he, he just picked up, he was just an ordinary 
Joe Bloggs, he'd picked up a dead cat, and he picked up a cat who had a dead m mouse in his mouth, and the cat, cat got sick, and the, he killed the cat, and then a few days later he got sick. And he actually survived after six weeks of intensive care and ventilation and dialysis. So it is possible, if you, you know, if it had modern health care to survive plague if you're lucky and you don't sort of get the overwhelming pneumonia. But, and just finally on plague, this was really strange because this chap here was working on an attenuated strain that was used for vaccine research and it was attenuated and that it couldn't actually take up iron from the environment and that just made it less virulent. And that's another story about iron metabolism and acute phase proteins and so on. But uh, so, 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 so he thought it's not very fair and he didn't wear gloves most of the time when he was working and he died with septicemia. He had the wrong antibiotics because nobody knew that he was working with plague bacillus. He got the wrong antibiotics but he was also found to have hereditary hemochromatosis which is a disease where you get raised iron levels in your blood. So even though that bacterium was mutated so that it couldn't absorb enough iron, this guy had so much iron in his blood that it got away anyway. And the next one, yellow fever, the virus top left there, transmitted by mosquito. And it's called yellow because it, it, the virus invades many organs in the body, including the liver, and it destroys the liver, so people become jaundiced, which is why it's called yellow fever. And when the liver cells become destroyed, you lose your clotting factor, so you start hemorrhaging. And We'll go into details here, but just to say there are different mosquito factors. Normally in, in the jungle it's different primates of the host and it's transmitted by mosquitoes between different primates. In the, in the city environment the humans act as the host and the mosquitoes serve as the intermediary to pass it between humans. And then you have furiaceous off a theme like that. And not quite sure if it's if you can transmit yellow fever directly person to person, if you get the blood on your hands, for instance, but it's possible you can. Maybe some of you can enlighten me on that. So, yellow fever wasn't native to the Americas. It was brought over with a slave trade. And so all these ships were going across from Africa and they brought slaves, some of, you know, and they probably had a milder illness because the mortality is only 5% so at the most. So many of the slaves would have been, would have had um, yellow fever but didn't actually die of it. And they also brought you know, mosquitoes over from the ships because there were lots of water vessels standing on these old wooden boats. So yellow fever really got hold in South America because they had the right mosquito vectors now. And there were a number of outbreaks in some American cities and this one, 1878, was in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'll just read what it says here. Uh, 46 deaths reported, making 101 since yesterday afternoon. The health officer and also Father Riordo or something and, and so on and so on, they all, they all died. And, and who W. B. Shepherd is in a critical condition and his wife is dead and a volunteer nurse died this morning and so on. So it was, you know, going rapidly around. And there were about 7,000 deaths, including, uh, including 33 doctors died in this outbreak. And these are some of the people who died. On the top left there, you have a, he was a priest, and we had a couple of nurses, and at the bottom there we had three medical staff who all died of yellow fever. Now we don't know if they caught it, caught it directly off their patients or whether they caught it because they stayed behind. A lot of the town city population fled into the mountains where there were no mosquitoes, but these people stayed behind, so it could have been transmitted via mosquitoes. But uh, so regardless, there are definitely people, who, doctors who died there with yellow fever. Uh, the first attempt or attempts to build the Panama Canal was thwarted by yellow fever. And there was something like 22,000 engineers and workers died. And they said there's something like one death for every yard of canal or something like that. And the, first, the, the French attempt was actually stopped because of the yellow fever deaths. Now the company back in France that was responsible for 
they're uh, building the Panama Canal, they're really worried about the bad publicity. So they said, oh, nothing to worry about. So they sent over the chief engineer plus his family and his family all died of yellow fever. So that's when they stopped. And then there was a Spanish-American war and from, you know, there were 3,000 American deaths. And this was to do with the liberation of Cuba from the Spanish. And there were so many deaths from yellow fever amongst American troops that the US Army set up a yellow fever commission in Cuba. And these were some of the chief people in the commission. And on the left there, you got Walter Reed, who, who was the head of the commission. And at that stage, they didn't know how it was transmitted and they didn't know what the infectious agents were. So they thought it was a bacteria and they tried culturing all the people who died, the tissues and so on, they couldn't find anything. And they didn't really, they started suspecting mosquitoes because there was a local pathology. She said, oh no, it's the mosquitoes. So they actually, during this, the time in Cuba, they set up special rooms where there were rooms where they could set, you know, I'd have, have different rooms, some with and some without mosquitoes and so on. Now the big problem was, you know, even though in theory monkeys get yellow fever, there probably weren't any monkeys in Cuba, so they had to use humans as volunteers. And, and Walter Reed went back to Washington to do something or other, and as soon as he'd gone, a couple, you know, that the people that left behind thought, oh, okay, we can get on with it now, so they decided to do self-experiments. And Lassar, 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 the top, he died of yellow fever. And James Carroll survived, but he died a few years later. He was never the same after that. And Clara Maas was a nurse who volunteered to be an, um, for it to be a, he volunteered to be a subject of an experiment to produce a immunization serum, whatever the heck that is. I haven't quite figured it out, whether it was anti serum or what, I don't know. So, so, they let, so she let mosquitoes, infected mosquitoes bite her and she died of yellow fever and there was such an out, outcry back in the States that was the end of any human experiments. And the thought that if you look at self-experimentation and medical research is quite popular even these days and so it looks like infectious diseases are at the top of the list. I mean, I think you'd probably be pretty brave to, you know, experiment on yourself using red, you know, x-rays or oncology drugs, but infectious diseases are a lot easier because you can just put yourself in the way of harm. Um, and unfortunately, some people died of their self-experiments. And that would be another talk another time. <laughs> and uh, there's a finally a yellow fever that was a, Rockefeller Commission in the 1920s to West Africa. And there were at least three notable deaths. Adrian Stokes probably died of affected mosquito bites, we don't really know. But Noguchi, I think I spelled his name right, he, he was a very brilliant researcher. He was involved in all sorts of other work and he went over and he was a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a tyrant and a bit crazy, I think. And he, he didn't even let the, animal handler into his, into his laboratory and he kept hundreds of apes and monkeys in his laboratory, big big room, and they're shearing a cage and they were tearing the tags of each other so you wouldn't know which monkey was which and which had been infected and so on. And it was absolute chaos. And then he said, oh, one day he said, I've had enough now, I'm going back home, I've done everything I can. So the boss was William Young and he breathed a big sigh of relief as a hooray, he's gone. But on the way out of uh, Lagos or Accra, Noguchi got sick and he died of yellow fever. And they think that he probably, well, he must have got infected either from the apes or monkeys that he was dealing with or mosquito bites. William Young almost certainly got sick because he was responsible for cleaning out the monkey house. I have actually seen one, one paper that said that Young did a post-mortem on Noguchi and I don't know if that's true or not, I don't know, maybe some of you know. But that's a possibility. But he certainly was, he spent a lot of time in the laboratory cleaning up after Noguchi left. So there's been some interesting papers I've still got to get round to read again. Yeah, and change the seas again. We have Otto Obermeyer, who again had been, had been a very keen researcher and he discovered the cause of relapsing fever. 
anyway, he'd been in his job for too long because the rule was he was an assistant researcher and he only had to stay for two years and he'd already been there for six years. So he was told to go. So he went and then he still wanted to care. He went home and he still wanted to do more experiments. And then it was an outbreak of cholera. So he started keeping specimens and store specimens and what have you in his bedroom at home. And he died of cholera. Now, we don't know if he did any self-experimentation or not, but it's remotely possible. And for those of you that aren't <coughs> medics, cholera is a bacterium that you get out of uh, drinking polluted water or food. And when it gets to the intestine, it sticks on the intestinal wall, produces lots and lots of toxins, which then make uh, metabolic changes so you lose massive amount of watery stools. We call it rice water stools. And on the right there, you can see what a cholera ward would look like. So you've, you know, the people that have cholera, they have just massive ongoing diarrhea and uncontrollable, just water. And they, they would die of dehydration within, within a day. So you can actually see very conveniently holes in the, in the beds there, and there'd be a big bucket underneath it to catch stuff as it came out. So there was a French cholera expedition to Egypt and there was there were two expeditions. There was a German one and it was a French one and the German one was led by Robert Koch. And many books and will say that he actually discovered the cholera of uh, Fabio cholerae, but that's not true. It was actually uh, 30 years discovered 30 years previously by another chap who called it Fabio cholera. So about that, so that's where some of these books that just take fiction from each other. So anyway, he was so Robert Koch was in the German expedition. They disappeared off to India, and then through the French expedition, 30 years, the French expedition stayed behind. Then after a couple of weeks, he suddenly came down with cholera and the doctors that were left behind frantically tried to save him. And they tried rehydration, oral rehydration with champagne, which would probably be, <laughs> it would taste nice, but I don't think it would be very useful. And the other thing they were doing apparently was subcutaneous ether. Now where on earth they got that from, I don't know, but neither of those died and he died of cholera. And this happened recently, like 10 years ago. A scientist had just come over from England and worked at ESR, the reference laboratory up in Wellington, Pororua. And within weeks, she came down with severe meningococcal disease and survived, but she lost her arms and legs. And that's similar to that person we saw before with bubonic plague who'd had you know, gangrene off the peripheries. And there was a big inquiry and everybody said, you know, what, what were the defects in the laboratory practices? You know, well, some of the things I'd heard was that they were opening life lysed files. You know, a lot of bacteria, they had freeze dried so that they're not actually in a broth or anything. They just freeze and then they're dried and they remain alive. And then when you flick open the top, you, if you're unlucky, you can get an aerosol in your face. And they were doing that on the open bench and they weren't wearing gloves and they weren't doing other things and so on. So meningococcal disease is definitely a risk to both clinical and laboratory staff, and the clinical staff can get infected if they're really close to a patient who's got meningococcal disease, because the bacteria will be in the upper airways as well. So if you're doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, you can get infected that way. And microbiology staff are at very high risk. They have about 40 times increased risk compared to the general population. And if they do get in face of meningococcal disease, the mortality is 50%. And the reason for that is that if you're dealing with cultures <coughs> in the laboratory and you're streaking out and you're producing aerosols and doing all sorts of other things, you get a massive dose of it, much higher than you normally would through contact with infected people. So we now have strict protocols <coughs> about dealing with suspected meningococcal dis uh, cultures. So, so just to remind you again, the different routes of infection. So the last few I want to talk about would, would be mostly percutaneous infection. 
Now, many of you, I'm sure, have heard the story before, but for those of you that haven't, in the days before anaesthetics, you know, if you were going to amputate a limb, you had to be pretty quick about it because, you know, your patient would be struggling like mad and you had lots of people trying to hold on to the patient. And, and uh, so that this guy, Robert Liston, he could actually do an amputation in less than two minutes. He was that quick. And you can also see in the background there spectators, to be spectators all around operating theatre. So the treatment, if you thought a limb was going to turn gangrenous, you would amputate the limb. With, and, and so, as I said before, an acidic, you had to be really quick about it. So he could do it in less than two minutes. But one of his operations, he managed to cut the fingers off one of his assistants. And both the patient and the assistant died of gangrene. So, either, you know, somehow or other their sore was contaminated. And also one of the spectators, you know, the whole, the whole episode, you know, when you're watching one of the surgery, you can imagine how absolutely traumatic it was. And there was stuff flying all over the place. And so one of the spectators was an elderly doctor, a retired doctor. And he, some, and somehow or other his coat, his long coat got cut. And he looked down and it was full of blood. And he thought, oh gosh, I've been cut, you know. So he promptly died of a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the few, one of the few operations with 300% mortality. <laughs> um, purple sepsis. You've all heard the story of Semmelweis, and you know how, per, you know it was probably Group A Streptococcus pyogenes, it's Group A Streptococcus, and that would be transmitted from corpses who had died uh, to women in labour and so on. And again, this is back in the early 1800s, before we knew about bacteria. And this, and, and if women were died of purple sepsis, basically you'd do a post-mortem. And there was no such thing as, you know, clean clothes and protection and that, you know, you just wore the same clothes when you do your post-mortem and then you want walk to somebody in labour and examine them. And, you know, basically, the, the, you know, the dirtier the coat, you know, the more respected you were because it showed you were actually busy. So he cut his finger doing an autopsy and died of peripheral sepsis, and that's when Semmelweis sort of realised, oh, maybe there's something going on that's, you know, whatever killed this pathologist is this, could be the same agent, whatever it is, that killed the women in, with peripheral sepsis, and that sort of led to the whole thing of hand hygiene, washing your hands with chlorinated lime. So you have somebody here who's died of peripheral sepsis through direct contact. Now this, I just read this in the last minute, because it's so fascinating. I didn't know that syphilis was an occupational disease, and I don't just mean <laughs> prostitute, I mean it's, a, it's, a, it's an occupational risk to clinicians as well. And there's any number of, you know, uh, accounts of doctors catching syphilis, you know, from inj on injuries on their fingers, wet nurses back a few hundred years ago, maybe they had syphilis, they would give it to the baby, and so sometimes the whole family got infected. And glass blowing was another risk activity. If you were doing glass blowing, you know, lots of people would share the same sort of blower, you know, and if one of them had syphilis, can get transmitted person to person that way. And the funniest stories I heard, heard of the lot was, was a tightrope act. And, what, and in a tightrope act, there would be this man on a tightrope with a pole, and there would be this woman assistant sitting on the shoulder. And this woman must have had syphilis because the ones doing the walking actually got syphilis on the back of his neck. <laughs> yeah. So, we've been, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's a big problem in dialysis units. It was a problem in dialysis first started. It's still a problem now, and it's all the blood-borne viruses, hepatitis B, C, and now HIV, and probably a few other agents that we haven't actually heard of. And there's a couple of notorious outbreaks in the England in the 60s with there were deaths, including medical and nursing staff. And the one in Edinburgh it was started because a patient got infected blood transfusion and then they had this 
dialysis machine, they, they changed the tubing between patients, but it was a trap where there was blood that wasn't changed between patients, and it was behind the cover, so nobody knew that was blood trapped in there. So there was uh, the dialysis, uh, so the hepatitis B just transmitted from patient to patient as they were being dialysed. And a number of staff members, I said, caught it as well. And there was a surgeon who did a surgery on somebody who had some sort of liver problem. They thought might have had a liver biliary obstruction. So, so he did surgery on somebody who had hepatitis B in the blood. A haematology receptionist, she was handling paper and she got a paper cut and she got hepatitis B and died. And a house officer, I think he had cuts in his hand and he got blood on his hands. And a laboratory technician and working in blood transfusion again, he had cuts in his hand and he got blood all over it. And this and related sort of incidents led to modern safety practices in the laboratory especially, but it's also now clinical areas because we realise obviously how, how dangerous these infections are. And uh, you've all heard of the recent kerfuffle with Ebola and before that we had Marburg and less of fever and so on, and depending where you are, the mortality is up to 90%. Uh, Marburg, is, it was, it's, it's a virus that's closely related to Ebola virus, and it's normally endemic in, I think, it monkeys and bats in, in Africa, and it doesn't, it's, and in the bats it's just a natural host, I think, so, and they don't get sick. But anyway, this batch of monkeys were brought over from Africa to work on vaccine research, and then some laboratory staff got sick with a flu-like illness, got admitted, and they got sicker and sicker. And some of the staff looking after them got the same illness, and they eventually died of, many of them died of a viral hemorrhagic fever, and that's what it was, it was Marburg virus. And amongst the people that got sick was laboratory staff handling either the animals or the patient specimens, medical staff looking after and nurses looking after the patients, a pathologist who did a post-mortem on one of the patients, and some family members caught it off the spouses, and, and one, one or two veterinarians got it as well. Now the people who died were the ones that were actually physically handling the infected monkeys, the secondary contacts that were lucky to escape death. And we've now had Ebola virus, and the healthcare workers in the last outbreak, somebody do some rapid mess, I forgot what it was, 5% or something like that, you know. So healthcare workers definitely had increased risk of getting Ebola virus. And the mortality is in the healthcare workers is much higher than in the general population. Again, probably it's dose related. Because what happens with Ebola virus, it's a virus that you get through cuts in your skin or through your mouth and it will multiply in just about every cell in your body except neutrophils. So every cell in your body will end up getting infected and you get infected endothelial cells which are the cells lining your blood vessels and they become leaky and you have infected liver cells so you lose your blood clotting factors and then you have many other organs as well and again you have this phenomenon we call as of cytokine storms, some of you probably heard that, where you have overwhelming immune reaction to all the virus, plus all the other things that are happening, like the capillaries. And towards the end, there will be as many as uh, 100 million viruses per mil of blood. And here you see viruses just escaping from some cells, uh, from the capillary cells. So towards the end, people will be leaking blood from, well, from the mouth, from everywhere, urine will have blood on it, so on, stool. so anything you touch is going to be highly, highly infectious. So, so how do we prevent some of these infections? No, and I'm afraid that none of us are perfect yet. We still quite often are a bit careless. We do have... Um, protocols about handling patients, like, you know, st standard precautions, as well, oh, I haven't even got that here, we've got standard precautions which apply to every patient whether, you know, they're infectious or not, and that, is, and that includes putting on gloves and if you think you're going to be handling any blood or excretions or whatever, 
in, in a laboratory would we would be a gloves if we're dealing with specimens directly, if we're dealing with tubes and so on. And contact precautions we use if somebody has something that's spread by direct contact, so we wear gloves and gowns when we go into the room. Droplet and airborne are variations of four infections spread by airborne routes like influenza and TB. And protective precautions is sort of reverse precautions if you're dealing with somebody who's immunocompromised. So if you have a transplant, for instance, you would be initially placed in protective isolation. And this is some of the equipment that we use. We have different masks for different, uh, you know, the top there we have a surgical mask, which is all right for about 20 minutes and then it becomes useless. So, you know, because it just gets moist as you breathe in and out. On the bottom left there, we have a, a proper N95 mask. We would wear that if, if you go into a room with airborne precautions. So it's a high filtration mask and it's got to fit properly around the face too. You know, we've got to do fit testing. There's no point, you know, you see, see that in the programs on TV, which is why I never watch them because I always say, that's wrong, you don't do it like that, you know. You. <laughs> I, can't. I mean, I've seen one episode where somebody died of something really, I can't remember the program, it was so terrible, but somebody had died of some terrible influenza and they were all dressed up to the nines with gowns and masks. And as soon as they died, that the patient died, they, they sort of went, oh, and tore off the mask yeah, in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Not realising that the ear's still infectious and so, yeah. <laughs> so, and then we have goggles and gloves now. To be fair, uh, when was rubber invented? Would it be a hundred years ago? I don't know. No? Don't know when we had rubber. And, 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 uh, and the modern sort of plastic gloves, we you know, they haven't been around very long either. So back last, the last but one century, 1800s and before that, we wouldn't have had gloves that would do any good anyway. We also have sharps containers because needle sticks, if it's such an issue, if you've got anything sharp, contaminated with blood or fluids or tissue, you know, if somebody sticks themselves, you risk transmitting any number of pathogens and not just the blood-borne pathogens, but even things like plague and that's some of the other ones we've seen. And this is the extreme version that we that they were using when they were looking after Ebola patients. And this would be somewhere like uh, Liberia. And this would be, would be completely, you know, it would be completely water impermeable. So you can imagine working in a heat 35, 40 degrees, humid heat, and wearing a completely impermeable suit. I mean, you, at the end of it all, you would be completely, you know, you can only last 40, 50 minutes, and then you would just have to come out. You couldn't stand it any longer. And you'd be so tired that you couldn't be relied upon to get rid of, take all the stuff off yourself, that you actually have to have an assistant to help you disrobe to make sure you get everything in the right order, that you don't miss anything. And then if you're really lucky, if you're in a Western world, you get shared off as well before you go to fire, you know, some sort of uh, hypochlorite shower, perhaps. And we have laboratory practices, we have standards, and again, there will be also healthcare standards. And we have strict rules about what we wear. On the left there, you can see one of our staff is wearing gloves when they're dealing with blood and tubes. And I get really cross if I wander around. And, you know, it's handing culture plates in microbiology, it's not quite so bad as long as it's not anything really nasty you're dealing with. But if you're dealing with tubes of blood and stuff like that, that's what we really have to watch out for. And we absolutely don't do mouth pipetting anymore. I remember when I first started as a registrar, mouth pipetting was very common and we had a number of people who got typhoid and shigella and, uh, you know, and that, and that was just how it was getting around. We even had parties in the laboratory Christmas time and people with smoke and you know, all sorts of things. <laughs> And we had a great time yesterday talking about some of the things we used to get up to in laboratories before these modern standards came into play. We have biohazard cabinets. The first biohazard cabinet when I first arrived in the 80s, all it was was a square box with a little bit of a cover that so that your eyes would be covered. And it was just an extraction fan, you know, just gently blowing air outside over the top of the roof of the building, probably right next to the air intake, I wouldn't know, but uh, it was completely inadequate. These are proper cap uh, uh, laminar flow cabinets, so as long as you don't disturb the airflow, 
and we have rules about who can wander around because we don't want any airflow disturbed. You, you actually have sorry, negative pressure, the air should go that way down up the tube and that goes through a special HEPA filter, high efficiency filter so that any thing that comes from whatever you're working on in there doesn't get sucked up and get blown out of the environment. And we also have uh, special safety centrifuges you can see there and they've got caps on them so that if anything breaks and when it's being centrifuged, you take it out and you look very carefully through the cover, it's transparent, just to make sure that nothing is broken and you open it up in a biohazard cabinet, or that's the theory anyway. It doesn't sort of happen a lot of the time. We do it in microbiology, definitely. So, let's just finish off. So all patients should be treated as infectious and specimens. And we, you know, you've got to, people, and this is obviously a talk I give to medical students, you know, every, you know, it's, you've got to understand what the hazards are, how pathogens get transmitted, wear personal protective equipment, and that would apply no matter what your occupation is out there as well. And safety protocols, they are there for a reason. They're not there to make life difficult for you. We also have, uh, you know, now auditing and, yeah, you know, what's it called, accreditation and things like that. If you get any injuries, you report them because sometimes we can actually do something about it. And if worst comes to the worst, you can claim ACC afterwards if something does happen. And if you're dealing with certain infectious agents, we recommend immunisation. So all microbiology staff, for instance, are, re are requested to get the meningococcal vaccine. They don't all take it up, but they're requested to have it. And unfortunately, the, we don't have vaccines for every strain of meningococcus, but we have, we have a vaccine for most of the common strains. And just to finish off, there's some really good references. This is a book that I found the other day when I was searching on the internet. It's about 200 megabytes or something. It took about 10 minutes to download, so I'm going to get into real trouble with my boss. Didn't realize it was going to be that big, but it's really good. It's got wonderful pictures and stories and uh, of various infectious diseases. And, uh, and there's some other uh, articles that I've come across, and you can now see where the, today's title came from. <coughs> And again, some the stories you can read in there are sort of like fiction because, you know, the myths that have been started back way beyond. So, unless I'll finish off there. <laughs> and, and you can now start sharing your own personal stories if you well, like. No, no. <laughs> Questions. The questions. No. Oh, okay. Angie, as you were talking, I was thinking about evolution of these uh, organisms and the relationship of smallpox and cowpox mm. and um, can, you, can you comment on the, the way in which these things evolve would I be right not, not between smallpox is uh, you know adapted well, evolutionarily I don't to the cow and so on well no. Cowpox, is a, it belongs in the same family of viruses but it's completely distinct from uh, smallpox uh, but the thing is, human beings can get cowpox, but it doesn't sort of tend to disseminate and cause overwhelming infection. And if you get cowpox, you become immunised. But it's only a partial immunity. If you, you know, they use the, the cowpox virus for the smallpox vaccine. Very few people would actually die from it, usually because they had some other underlying problem. But you'd have to immunise every three years, or it just would, would fade away. What I was getting yeah, at was yeah, the, but I don't know uh, what the do, do, do microbiologists study the way organisms are evolving to try and predict what's going to happen next? Is that no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We need a microbiologist. Any other microbiologist? To... <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Uh, it's all become, you know, all to do with DNA sequencing now, and I don't know how much you can... You know, we are terribly worried about viruses that, for instance, that can evolve, mutate, and evolve rapidly, and influenza viruses are... Mm -hmm. Classic example, but they've actually made a nasty influen avian influenza virus and changed it in a laboratory in such a way that it can be transmitted theoretically person to person, you know, very easily. And there was a big fuss about six years ago when they tried to publish that and they wouldn't publish it initially because normally avian influenza, you can get 
pass it person to person, but it's very difficult because it's, the virus infects cells way down in the bottom of your lungs, and it's not the sort of thing that you would normally get, even if you're dealing with somebody with even influenza. You need a massive aerosol to arrive deep in your lungs so um, before you actually get infected yourself. So, so people have experimented trying to see how the virus can be changed to cause human infection. But it's sort of a bit difficult to predict what's going to happen next. I mean, you know, we've been hit by MERS now and, uh, and nobody quite knows where it's come from and nobody saw it coming. So I think bacteria based and viruses have a life of their own and we just, we just make life easier for them because there's so many of us now and we crowd ourselves together and we have lots of pollution and we have lots of animals crowded together and we change the environment and we make toxins and some of the toxins are known to lead to antibiotic resistance. So I think we've, just, I think we've hastened evolution just by multiplying and becoming very effective. <laughs> Efficient. Kristen, yeah. I know this was a sort of healthcare focus, but uh, as if we don't have enough problems already, do you know much about what the military are doing to deliberately produce <coughs> biological warfare? Vectors? No, they haven't told me that. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that would be deliberate well, uh, infection in a conflict. Situation. Well, most of that sort of work would be highly secret, obviously. Uh, but the, I, I do know that there are military installations and islands in Scotland that nobody knows anything about and nobody's allowed in. And uh, so I'm sure there's biological warfare, but I don't know what they're doing in the way of... Uh, I know they've done anthrax, exp anthrax experiments back in the Second World War and you can still find live anthrax spores in the soil even today. That's 70 years later. Oh, a very interesting one was back in the Second World War, the end of the Second World War, and it was not really evolution of bacteria, but it was just the military playing around. They thought, we want to study air currents and see how bacteria get dispersed in air currents. So the US Navy or Air Force decided to release balloons, great big balloons full of serratia mycescens, and they are bacteria that produce bright red colonies when you grow them on agar. So they're free to all the planes with the tying the balloons behind them over San Francisco Harbor, and then they burst the balloons, and they thought it was a bacteria that wasn't going to cause infection in humans, that it was completely non-pathogenic, and then within a week, people started getting admitted to hospital with serratia infection, and one or two people died as a result. So it's... <laughs> Was Pasturella pestis. It used to be called Pasturella, after, named after Pasture, and then they called it Yersinia after Yersin, and they, you know, they keep changing their names. There, I was going to ask, is there sort of an international committee that Oh yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, names? yeah, yeah, and they, we've now got a, a oh, yeah, we've now got a brand new machine in the laboratory, we've had it for four years, it's called a Maldi Tuff, it's like a, it's a protein spectrometer thing. And it's all computerized, and the database is so huge and up to date that every day we get bacteria we've never heard of before, and we've got to spend half the day googling and say, "Well, the heck is that? What's you know? What's a Pantoja? What's a something or other? I can't even think of the names." And some of you guys, you know, so uh, in the lab will <laughs> agree with me. So that, but the thing is, the database on our Maldi Tuff has deliberately does not include agents of bioterrorism. So if you had a bacillus anthracis, that's the anthrax bacillus, or a febria cholera even, it wouldn't, it won't identify it for you, it'll just call it something else. And a few months ago, we had somebody, the history was diarrhea, come back from Thailand, and we were pretty sure it was febria cholera, but it just wouldn't identify it because it, they, do, they don't want that machine to, in a database to come into the hands of terrorists. But yeah, that's crazy because <laughs> there are plenty of other ways we have of identifying that organism. It's not that difficult. <laughs> So, so yes, they change the names all the time, and there's quite often there's historical reasons. So you, they must have decided Yersin was a more appropriate person in past year. But I think it probably used to be called Bacillus pestis or something that before then. And uh, many bacteria have lots of names. Questions? Yeah, whatever. It's an answer to the question you asked. I believe it might be possible to look back in history because all 
and we will all agree that biological organisms, they depend on the conditions of existence for the viability and, you know, propagation. So when you ask the question, for example, the potato famine in Ireland about 150 odd years back, because of intensive potato farming, you know, the, the organism had the conditions to yeah. thrive. And lo a lot yeah. of the examples, so we could look back to see what were the conditions which allowed that organism to adapt and evolve. Mm. But unless if we know what's going to happen in the future, we I won't know. be able to predict. All we know is that whatever we're doing to the world's environment is bad news. You know, we've got monoculture, we're yeah. bringing animals and crops in from around the world, and uh, so yeah. All the intensification. And, and, and then we do selective breeding, and then, you know, of all the cattle species that we've only really grow about 20 or 30 of them, and all the other species are allowed to die away, and so we're losing an immense genetic, you know, crop there of people, of things that we might need in the future, and that's the same for many organisms. Uh, Angie, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was an amazing to compressed so much into <laughs> such a relatively short space of time. But I was uh, wondering whether we might be able to have a, a session two. Who's we? Because the thing, all of us, <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, because one of the things that... I'll push to do that. <laughs> one of the things that interests me is we had a patient many years ago with Kreutzfeld Jakob disease, yeah. which That's raised right. the spectre of prion pathology. And I'm just wondering whether this is the next stage of the evolutionary message that uh, you've been giving us today as well about the pathogenicity of these things that are mm. non living creatures that can produce so much pathology to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I don't. I wasn't here when that patient. That's the one that got it through uh, Duramata, wasn't it? Through neurosurgery. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the risks that you have with neurosurgery. That's. But I mean, of course, we we changed biology with uh, mad cow disease (BSE) because what we started, you know, they, they were starting because they, they were crowding all these cattle in barns and they had to feed them protein so they produced milk. So any cattle that was past it, or beginning to stagger, they would send to the works and then grind it up and feed it back to the original cattle as protein, and that's where BSE came from. So we, we help evolution, there's no doubt about that. Another question? No. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, just for my to say, Angie, thank you so much for uh, just a wonderful presentation. Mm. Really mm. great. So please join me in thanking Angie.